But it's missing something. Uh, can we bring up the house lights? Just for a second. Is there, can I see? Yeah, okay. Is there anywhere in the house a beloved actor, writer, blogger, gamer, and star of the seminal 1980s, 90s science fiction TV show? Is there somebody like that? Right, there he is. Mr. Will Wheaton. Well, um, as someone who has, yes, as someone who has performed this sort of uh, first person narratives for this audience before, is there anything that you think that I could do to somehow add depth, complexity, and cover up any flaws I might have? Perform in front of an obnoxious backdrop. <laughs> that hasn't worked so far. What else have you got? Uh, add music, perhaps. Music? Yes. Music, music, music. Provided by whom would you recommend? Uh, Ira Glass and the Lifers? <laughs> He's on a hipper boat somewhere. Yeah, he's on that boat with the goatee, though. Exactly. <laughs> Hanging from its yeah, four peak. Uh, then, if failing their availability, I would recommend perhaps former members of Da Vinci's Notebook, if any are available. All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Paul and Storm, my good friend. Because more, because more than even dreaming of being in this boat with you, I've always dreamed in my life of musical underscoring. <laughs> you guys ready? All right. This one is called Burning Love. About two months after we met, I said to my future wife, I think we should live together. I bet you do, little man, Beth said. <laughs> the little man was not spoken aloud, but still all men within a 10 mile radius reflexively flinched as the shock wave hit them. Well, I've played house before, she went on, and never again, not without a real commitment. Then her side mounted eye lasers burned off my hair. <laughs> That's what happened. I wanted to spend every moment possible with this beguiling woman. Plus, I wanted to stop paying rent in my one-bedroom duplex for the sole benefit of my two cats. Beth was deathly allergic to them and couldn't even enter my place, so I had largely ceased to live there. Every day, oh, okay, every other day, okay, every third day, I would return to my apartment in the mid-morning to face questioning sad looks from my cats. Where you been, man? They seemed to say. Is it us? I would assure them that there was nothing wrong and slink back to the house where Beth rented a bedroom. Once I came home close to lunch and the cats were lint rolling their own hair off the couch. <laughs> Whatever it takes, they seemed to say. <laughs> this did not actually happen, of course. In reality, they were only able to bat the lint roller around fruitlessly with their non-prehensile paws. But I sensed their intent. <laughs> my cohabitation proposal was shot down. Beth and I got into our cars after a night out and agreed, as per usual, to meet back at her house. I fleetingly thought of my cats. Maybe I'd bring them some flowers or a small dead rodent. Tomorrow. I was at the far end of Beth's block before I realized that I must have driven past her house. This seemed strange, but I'm absent-minded and easily distracted, so I just turned around and went back. I missed it again. I turned around to make a third trip down the block, a slower pass, counting off the house numbers. Her house, as it turns out, was still there. The reason I hadn't noticed it was because all the lights were out, and the usually yellow house was now black. I parked, walked up to the door, and noticed that somebody, perhaps as an art project, had decided to toss most of the first floor furniture through the smashed windows and onto the lawn, where the various pieces had melted chair or sofa or table-shaped holes in the snow. I carefully walked through the broken front door. The house looked as if every surface had been spray-painted black by a group of efficient but unimaginative graffiti artists. <laughs> As it turned out, Beth had returned home herself moments before to discover that her housemate had been stripping paint with steel wool and flammable solvent and had set off a spark. I eventually found her in the house next door where she was trying to comfort her housemate, who was unharmed but rocking in place in the manner of Job. 
This, of course, was my chance. <laughs> You're coming with me, I said. <coughs> Since her own bed was now merrily glowing red in the inside, like one of those electric fake fireplace, lo fireplace logs, she agreed. I drove the still-stunned Beth over to my apartment and left her waiting in the car for a moment while I shooed the cats into the back stairway. Eventually, I ushered Beth up, and she changed into some of my old sweatpants, climbed into my bed, and concentrated on trying to breathe. And there, with occasional changes of clothing and posture, she has remained ever since. And when we kiss, ooh, fire. <laughs> Our daughters love this story because to them there's nothing more romantic than a guy rescuing his enamorata from a burning building. They like to invite their grammar school boyfriends over and have me light a match so they can reject anyone who flinches. <laughs> The cats, meanwhile, were adopted by the woman who lived downstairs. She took a 1960s commute approach to cat ownership, meaning that they were allowed to roam anywhere they liked, and most often they roamed up the stairs back to my apartment, where they would scratch in the back door and sing, and I am telling you I'm not going from Dreamgirls. <laughs> had nothing to do with the fire. It was, like many turning points in many life stories, mere random chance. But even on the scale of interventions of fate, it was pretty dramatic. I ask a woman to live with me, she says no. A short time later, her house spontaneously combusts. <laughs> with that example, I have taken a more accepting, passive approach to achieving my desires in life. If somebody refuses a request, or if things don't work out the way I had desired, I don't argue. I sit back, and I wait for something to explode. <laughs> Paul, let's start